Good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. This is a, um, a, a special lecture at an unconventional time, but we had a special guest here today, and we wanted to give her a chance to, um, to, to, to give a talk. And also, she's meeting with various of us today. So by way of background, um, I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at the US National Institutes of Health. I'm normally in this room, most typically for institute director meetings, where there's a table set up and there's 27 institute directors around the table working with the NIH director and others, but it's fun to use this room in a different way. But I am here to introduce um, a guest speaker today, um, who I'm thrilled to say I've known for a couple of years virtually, but only about 10 minutes ago did we actually meet each other in person for the first time. So uh, this is uh, Kira uh, Deneen, who has hosted or produced more than 10 podcasts, uh, but her flagship podcast is DNA Today, uh, for which she is the creator, she's the host, she's the producer. Now, DNA Today is now in the top 1% of podcasts globally. In each episode of DNA Today, Kira highlights an advance in the world of genetics or genomics and talks about genetic and genomic technologies, disorders, um, news, and so forth. What I learned just a few minutes ago is that she started this podcast and started podcasting as a senior in high school um, and has been doing it ever since. Um, now for over 12 years or so, at least with DNA Today, over 12 years, producing 290 episodes with support of over 70 sponsors. And uh, DNA Today has won the Best Science and Medicine Podcast Award for three years. And Kira was elected into the Podcast Academy and previously served on the National Society of Genetic Counselors Digital Ambassador Program. Um, for her professional training, of which I also learned what didn't happen that long ago, um, she received a Diagnostic Genetic Bachelor's of Science degree from the University of Connecticut, which is, I think, her home state. And she's a certified cytogenetic technologist. Uh, she received a Master's of Science at St. Lor Sarah Lawrence College and is a practicing and licensed certified genetic counselor. So I first met her um, virtually when she interviewed me twice in 2022 for a podcast, first in April and then in December. And then for the December 2022 podcast, uh, we decided to do something um, uh, different where we just decided to do a year in review of the top genetics and genomic stories of 2022. And that was a lot of fun to do in 2022. So when she invited me back to do the same thing in 2023, I said, absolutely, but I have even a, another idea. Let me bring the current president of the American Society of Human Genetics, because the, whoever the current president is, in that case, it was Brendan Lee, they're sort of you know, all in on what's going on in genetics for that year in particular. Um, and so that was a great episode as well. And in fact, we've just decided uh, back in December that we like that so much that in the future, we're going to now always do year-end podcasts in December of every year with me and whoever the ASHG president is for that year. And this, this year it'll be uh, Bruce Gelb. Um, and he's already agreed and I don't, it may even be scheduled or it's going to be scheduled soon. So all of these podcasts, as you can imagine, are online. And I really encourage you to check them out. I mean, there's now they number in the hundreds. So you have lots to catch up on if you haven't heard any of them yet already. Well, because of the success of, uh, oh, by the way, you're going to quickly find out, I am sure within a few minutes of Kira talking, that like me, she's exquisitely energetic and enthusiastic, yeah, right. which means <laughs> when the two of us together get together on the podcasts, all the audio people, they're all adjusting the audio, <laughs> and there's a lot of a lot of just gesticulating, and we really geek out. So you're going to see why I'm so happy she's here today. Uh, we invited her to come here um, and to, um, to spend time with us. Um, especially our communications folks, our genetic counseling folks, and others, um, just to sort of geek out and you know talk about things and maybe even explore other things of mutual interest in the arena of science communication. So that's why she's here today. She's going to tell us a little bit about her more than decade-long experience as a podcaster, uh, fueled uh, as you will hear from about with her passion for science communication. So I couldn't be any more excited to have Kira here with us today. So please welcome me and uh, welcome welcome her to the podium. Thank you. How I'm supposed to follow that now. I think that's probably the best introduction I've ever had. So um, thank you. Um, it's very exciting to be here. It feels very surreal of just starting podcasting from my you know, childhood bedroom to now being at the NIH. So this is very, very exciting to be able to do. Um, so thank you, Dr. Green. And you'll, uh, you'll see episodes that he's been in and some of the other people in the crowd. Um, 
So just as he mentioned, um, this is kind of my disclaimer, but also like showing how many sponsors the show has had over the years. Um, so we've had over 70 sponsors of the show. Um, I don't think anything comes up in terms of a disclaimer aspect, but it's always good to throw it in there, right? Um, so just in terms of the different companies we've worked with, um, a lot of different labs, but also genetic counseling programs, a um, lot of different organizations, nonprofits, um, Johns Hopkins is on there too. Um, so just very exciting that we've been able to really build up this listenership to allow us to work with so many different genetic brands, I would even say, to be able to collaborate and produce episodes to educate people. And so just to give you an overview of what I'm going to chat about today with you guys um, is, you know, filling in a couple things of my journey, but uh, Dr. Green did such a great job of just kind of giving you the background. Talking about why podcasts is so great in terms of being a great medium and how it's very different from others. Talk about some basics if anyone is interested um, in getting more into the audio space and just having really great uh, crisp audio. And then talking about networking and booking. Obviously, if I wasn't uh, decent at networking, I wouldn't be here. Um, you know, cold emails work. That's how Dr. Green and I are pretty sure connected. Um, and then I think what's going to be the most um, helpful is providing some tips of you guys being in interviews. So being able to be a guest and being a stellar guest, and also if you're on the other side of the mic, so to speak, being a really good interviewer um, and being able to prepare for that and just being able to share a lot more about genetics with our community. So talking a little of my journey. Um, so I am from Connecticut, went to the University of Connecticut. Um, once I started there after a couple years of doing, it was just a podcast. Then I was able to adapt it into a radio show. Um, so it still plays actually at WHUS. 91.7, um, does not reach down here, so that doesn't really matter too much. Um, but cool that it also is a public radio station there. Um, and then while I was at UConn as an undergrad, I started working for Ellen Matloff, who you guys might know 10 years ago was on the Supreme Court case as a plaintiff for the Gene Patents case. And so kind of connected with her. And once we found out that we both were living in Connecticut, she was like, well, why don't you just start interning for me? And I was like, wow, this is great. So networking, you know, I guess is kind of the theme of this, of that really works. And then went to Sarah Lawrence um, for grad school. And I've done a bunch of different shows over the years. Obviously, DNA Today is the one that has been my main show and will continue to be. Um, I am a total nerd, so there was too many Harry Potter podcasts. So I said, well, what's the next upcoming series? The Hunger Games. So I started a Hunger Games podcast. Um, once they announced that there was going to be movies, I was like, okay, this is going to be a big franchise. Um, so that's what that bottom middle one is. Um, but pretty much all the other shows are science, rare disease based. Um, there is one that's an entrepreneur show, the top right. Um, but yeah, everything else is, you know, in that science space. Um, recently got to work with the Journal of Genetic Counseling to launch DNA Dialogues. That's the first show there. Um, and that's been really fun. My voice is rarely on it, only if they need something recorded very last minute, like a little promo. Um, but being able to really help them launch that and figure out how they wanted to develop the series. And the premise for that is basically taking authors of recent publications, having them on for about maybe 10, 15 minutes and just talking about their paper. So it's a really great way to have another avenue for people to be able to share their work and have it be very accessible that you can just listen to it. Um, Dr. Green was on the Phenotip Speaker series at least once. Um, and so, you know, kind of the other podcasts there, are a lot of them, um, one that's kind of relevant to you guys also is it happened to me next to DNA today there. Um, so the two women that are the co-hosts on there both have rare diseases, um, that limit their vision. And I actually got to meet them for the first time last night because they live in Bethesda. So a lot of the people they have come on are their own doctors and many of them are NIH based. So if you wanna see your colleagues on there, um, there's a lot of great episodes there. But it's been very fun to take what I've learned from DNA Today and then apply it to all of these other podcasts, obviously with various roles there. 
And just a little about DNA today. Um, next week, we're hitting 300 episodes. So it's very exciting to kind of hit that landmark. Um, it was, I don't know, has anyone seen the Netflix documentary, The Man with Thousand Children or Kids? Yes, we're all a little disturbed by that, hopefully. Um, I was able to sit down with um, two people from the series. So one of the parents from Australia, so that awesome accent, <laughs> and then one of the um, US-based um, person, Eve Wiley, that's uh, very much an advocate. So um, haven't even announced that yet, but that's coming out next week. So it was very cool to be able to sit down and Netflix had to approve it and all the fun stuff. Um, but our audience of the show is you guys. So people that are working in genetics, healthcare providers, laboratory technologists, technicians, students, and people that are just like, genetics is cool, which is where hopefully we all started, right? Um, and you know, obviously we cover anything really related to genetics and it's been a weekly show for, uh, quite a few years now. And it's been really, really humbling to have won a few awards. Um, I'm going to shamelessly ask you guys to vote for us in the current podcast awards at the end. I'll give you a QR code. Uh, but it's been really fun just to connect with the community and, and be recognized not just by the genetics and science community, but also the podcasting space. Um, so here's where we get some great shout outs. So we've done a lot of great episodes. Um, over the years with some genetic counselors that you guys work with, um, and, uh, you know, Carrie's on there. Um, and so just a lot of, uh, great interviews that we've been able to do might've missed a couple. I was kind of searching through, um, but, uh, yeah, so it's just been great to be able to feature a lot of my favorite interviews or when we get some kind of genetics expert that works in the field with a patient advocate. And that's what we were able to do with, with Carrie and Julie Sapp. And uh, so a lot of, lot of great interviews kind of have that set up so we can have both perspectives. I've talked about Dr. Grieve enough, so you guys know that. Um, some other just interesting <laughs> episodes. Um, we ha were able to interview, anybody watch Glee when that was big? I was in high school when that was really big. Um, so got to interview Lauren Potter and she is so much like her character, uh, Becky Jackson. She's kind of, uh, uh, oh, I'm blanking on her name. Uh, Sue Sylvester is the character, um, her right hand woman throughout the series. She's in all six seasons and she's very spunky. She was very fun to be able to interview. Um, and you know, uh, another fun one was, uh, Maury Povich. That was cool. We actually got to do it in person. My editing skills are not that good. We actually are in person there. And so that was really cool because obviously he does paternity testing. So that's where our worlds collide. I've ordered that a couple times for patients, but to be able to tell him some statistics of how rare some things were, was very cool that we both interviewed each other, um, in different ways. And, um, something that I was, um, talking with the genetic counselors, including Carrie this morning was just how important looking at African genomes are. And that was a very interesting episode I did with uh, Dr. Janina Jeff, um, who has her own podcast called In Those Genes. Um, so obviously was able to do a lot of fun episodes over the years, but kind of just a few to share. But why podcasting? Why did I choose this as my platform? So, you know, not to throw a bunch of numbers at you, but when we look at how many podcasts are out there, we're looking about 4 million. And I just pulled this stat this month. So this is recent, uh, July, 2024 for people watching later and compare that to 600 million blogs that are out there, 600 million compared to 4 million. So your competition is so much less. And then once you start looking at, well, how many podcasts are actually active monthly? Like if they're not active monthly, they're probably not active at all, right? Unless they're doing seasons. We have some shows like Serial that you guys probably heard of like about 10 years ago. So that's only like 300,000. And then you look at the podcasts that are active weekly, like mine. Now you get hundred down to 200,000. So your competition is not that much. And that's all podcasts, let alone what about science shows? What about genetic shows? So it's just really, you're able to connect with people and not really have as much competition. And if anyone listens to podcasts, you probably don't just listen to one, right? You listen to multiple, especially you go on a road trip, you're, you're going on a plane, you're downloading. So being able to cross collaborate is a big aspect there, but the, the medium allows for that. And what's so unique about podcasting is you're hearing that person's voice. If you listen to the same podcast over and over, you feel like you know that host, right? I feel like I know Dak Shepard. He has no idea I exist, but Armchair Expert is a fantastic show. It's made me think of things in a different way. And I feel like I know him and Monica, right? So you develop a relationship with that host. And by doing so, 
you have a lot of power in terms of recommending things and doing marketing and saying, hey, I'm going to this event. I really hope to see you there. And you get long-term marketing exposure too, because unlike other things, you probably don't read a blog post from a long time ago, unless it's a recipe and you got to scroll through the whole story behind the recipe, right? But when it comes to podcast, you will listen to an old episode. And even in genetics, if you're, obviously the news stories are not going to be timely, but when you're listening to an interview with a patient, then it's a little bit different, right? Like you can still glean a lot of information from that. What's also interesting is I'm sure you've all heard podcast advertisements and they say, use code DNA today for 25% off cast or matches, whatever it is, right? And so that's very trackable. Anytime you use that, people are like, oh wow, people really do use this code even if maybe the promo isn't that good or whatever, saying, hey, you're gonna help the show by you know, checking out this thing or signing up for this webinar or whatever it is. So being able to track that. You see a billboard and you go check that out later, there's no tracking there. Um, and it's been growing a lot. So this one is an older stat, I'll admit, but for you know, what I would say, I guess, you know, uh, zillennials, I guess, 18 to 34, most of them are listening to podcasts on a monthly basis. That's probably higher since I got that. Um, so there's just so much uniqueness in this and there's a lot of money behind it. So a lot of companies have realized the power that podcast hosts and other types of broadcast mediums like YouTube, you guys have Genome TV, hello for people watching this on Genome TV, that a lot of companies have realized the power in that and being able to connect with audiences. So what about some basics? So this is a busy slide, right? Um, but honestly, if you wanna get really into it, you can get all the gear, right? But the dark green is really the essentials. So obviously you want some kind of mic stand like this, I won't touch it because you'll hear it. I think this is called a gooseneck. Um, some kind of mic stand so that if you hit the desk, it's not going to sound as loud. Obviously some kind of camera, computer tablet, um, a pop filter is good. So when you go pop, pop, you hear this where it like explodes on the mic, the plosive. So having an extra filter on there limits that a little bit. And obviously if you're not being as dramatic as I am, that helps too. Um, you can see though that the way I started was standard. You can see way too much eyeliner. So clearly that's over 10 years ago. Um, and that's a hundred dollar microphone. It's a blue Yeti microphone. The price has not really changed in 10 years. And I have that pop filter on there. That's that extra metal piece on there. So that setup with the mic stand, um, is less than $150. So it's, it's quite affordable to be able to have good audio. And even with us all still doing a lot of zoom calls and all that, I very much appreciate when someone has crisp audio, obviously, right? That's kind of what I do. Um, and some digital tools that I found helpful over the years of any kind of science communication. Um, I've got Squarespace for, that's what I use for websites. Canva is amazing. We use the free tier for a long time. Um, ChatGPT, obviously, and we'll kind of uh, explore that a little bit. Um, GoDaddy is where we got our domain name, so the .com, when you wanna get that. Um, an even better version of Zoom is called Riverside. And so that's really great to be able to um, have, again, that crisp audio and it uh, records locally. So if I'm recording with one of you, your computer is going to record you and then upload it to my server. So it's even better quality. Um, and then we use Constant Contact for our email um, marketing that we send out about once a month. And then our podcast is hosted on Podbean. So that's where it lives. And then you guys access it on like Spotify, Apple. That's where we push it out to. Um, I don't have sponsorships with any of these. Um, there's just the tools that I found to be like kind of the best in the market. But getting into networking, um, a fellow podcaster, um, Jordan Harbinger, he has this great quote that I really have circled back to a lot. And it's when you introduce two people, you're almost as useful as the person who's actually doing the job. In some ways, you're even more valuable since you're the source of the relationship. And I've really found that. The only way that we've been able to have so many sponsors of the show and really build that up is because I'm constantly networking and I really love doing that. I love meeting people, otherwise I wouldn't do an interview show, right? So a lot of my days are talking to people and I love that. And it's just so helpful that I love being able to connect other people too. And you never know where that relationship is gonna go in your career. Um, so I, I find it's just really helpful to network. And, and the main way I do that virtually when I'm not at conferences and at different events is LinkedIn, and I don't yet pay for LinkedIn. I don't know why I really need to do that, um, but you can do so much with the free version of LinkedIn. 
And I'll kind of give an example of a previous sponsor. This company is no longer um, around, so I kind of figure it's a good example. So when I go on to LinkedIn, I'm like, all right, I want to connect with this company. Maybe I want them to be a future sponsor of the show. Um, I start out hitting the people tab and I look to see, well, who am I already connected with? Maybe there's someone on there. So I knew I was already connected with Katie Sagasser. I knew her through Dina DNA. I'm sure you guys know her, Dina Goldberg, um, very much on TikTok and uh, Instagram and a lot of places there. Um, so kind of see that we're connected. I see I'm connected with someone named Sarah here that um, I didn't personally know. It was probably one of those things where we connected with each other and just saw we had mutual interests. But if I'm like, well, if I'm trying to pitch them to be a sponsor and come on the show, the real person seems to be the global marketing executive. That seems to be the highest tier person, I guess. So I could ask Katie for, you know, oh, could you introduce me? But maybe I'm antsy and just want to put it out there. Or at this time, I didn't know Katie that well, like I do now. So go on to Stephanie's um, page here. And again, you can see what those mutual connections are. So you could say, well, maybe reach out to one of those people. Or you could just hit connect. And I always add a note when I connect with someone. Now recently, in the past few months, I've noticed you can only send so many of these a month. So now I have to decide, okay, is this someone that I'm really trying to connect with for a, a uh, purpose quickly, or is this someone that I just want my network long-term? So I added a note to Stephanie said, hey, I have been learning about Juno and I think it'd be a great match for the show. Would you want to explore a potential um, collaboration? Um, and then that's how they ended up being a sponsor on the show um, and that we kind of connected and, um, you know, was able to do an episode around their products. And um, sorry that the slide is a little off. I made these in Google Slides. Um, so one part about being a speaker and wanting to put yourself out there as a guest a lot more is having a media kit. So I use Canva to create this. And it's really easy because once you create it in Canva, you can then have a link that you send to people. So I used to download this as a PDF kit and then attach it to emails. But then I learned when you attach something to an email and you're sending it to someone that you haven't emailed with before, it's more likely to go into junk mail. And I was like, oh, maybe that's why I'm not getting answers, right? So then I started just saying, oh, let me include a link. Hey, here's my media kit. And I started getting a lot more responses just simply with that. So you live and learn, right? And so then I can also keep it updated. So if someone goes back to an email from a year ago and they click on the link, they're seeing my most recent version of my media kit. And just having a little bio about yourself, topics that you talk about, science communications, hmm, okay. So going through and people can just scan quickly and say, oh, we really want you to come on and talk about recent advances in CRISPR. Um, we want you to come on and, and talk about what type of genetic testing is related to pregnancy. So um, I didn't mention, but two days a week I see patients in the prenatal setting. So having that is really makes it easy that you can read it, the font is really big. Uh, this is just a couple pages of the media kit, but I also, obviously, you need to have your contact information on there. Um, can't oversee the small things. And then if you're on the other side of things, I have a podcast version of this. So all about the show, having some statistics there. Um, you know, we have other pages that show, like I showed before, of like some interesting guests we've had on and topics that we like diving into. Um, we have a collage, like I showed you, of our sponsors, and so that they can say, oh, well, you know, Johns Hopkins has been a sponsor, like, you know, oh, maybe we should consider that. That seems to be, you know, they're, you know, quite a name in our field, right? So being able to put this together, a lot of times when you do, do go to ask to speak, they'll say, oh, we'll send over your media kit. So that's something that if you are looking to do a lot more speaking in different ways, it's very helpful to have that, and you just look way more professional in that sense. And then the social media aspect of science communication, right? I think that's something that is like the first, you know, easy way that we can get into this. And a great way to increase engagement, and I will say a cheap way, I'm someone that's very frugal, is doing a book giveaway. For 15 bucks, I can send someone a book, and all these people, the authors have been on the show, so then we're also promoting that episode. Um, and we get a lot of entries. This one where you could tell I was having a bad hair day and I tried to take the picture with the hair down, didn't, didn't work. But the Genome Odyssey, that got over 500 entries. Like people love books, right? In our community, not everybody. Um, but you know, we, we love a good genetics book. And so that's a really easy way to help promote the author, have that connection and have people interested. 
And then got to give Jenny a shout out here. I am also like starstruck to meet Jenny today and know the person behind your social media channel is, wow, I've wondered for years. Um, so other ways that you can connect on social, right? So, I mean, Regina George, like, hello, what a great idea, right? So, you know, uh, props to Jenny for coming up. I assume this is your post. Yes, beautiful. Uh, I want to make sure I give credit to the right person. But being able to connect, right? So many generations now have enjoyed Mean Girls, especially with the new movie coming out this year. Um, and being able to, you know, I couldn't include, because I was trying to get everything in there, and nowadays you gotta scroll and all that, but this one has quite the engagement. I think one of your most popular ones in recent months. Um, so being able to have something engaging that makes people stop, and also educating, right? Of talking about RNA here. Um, I guess it's kind of an RNA themed slide because all the way on the left, we did an episode with Ambry Genetics, who is a sponsor, um, and just being able to include different emojis. And we have a, a video of talking about how the exome of today is better than yesterday, but not as good as tomorrow. And so that was such a good sound bit. And I'm like, wow, that's like, boom, right there. And being able to isolate that into a video and share to have that be quick. Um, the middle phone here is looking at, I interviewed Victoria Gray, who you guys might, you know, that name might be familiar. She was the first person that was treated with CRISPR for sickle cell, and she has been symptom free since. Um, and so she talks about the medical racism she faced, um, when she came on the show and just how life changing it's been, um, especially for her as a mom and being able to work and, and so much. So being able to capture that and have moments. Um, but there's so many different ways to do this, you know, especially if you're starting out. And in terms of starting out, looking at different speaking opportunities. So obviously you can come on podcasts, right? That's pretty clear. But there's so many other venues that even going back to your old middle school, high school, undergrad, masters, if you went to that, like, and saying, hey, I would love to talk about what I do or this aspect of genetics that you're involved in and you're doing a project on. Teachers, I find, love that. It's one less lesson to plan, right? Teachers have to do so much. So, and it's really, it feels full circle when you get to go back to your old schools and being able to talk to kids that when you were sitting in that seat, you would have been like, wow, this would have been so cool. And you never know the downstream effects. I'm sure there's people that I've talked to that have since gone into genetics. They, some have reached out, um, others, you know, I assume go, might go into it and I don't hear. Um, and then obviously conferences. There's so many opportunities of these hybrid online or in-person conferences and putting your name out there, applying to them um, and putting together, using chat GPT and other tools to be able to put together your proposal and say, I wanna talk about this topic. Um, you know, sometimes there's not enough people that are applying. Um, especially for certain things like I found pre-conference symposiums tend to get less applications, at least for NSGC, than others I've learned. Um, so it's really, really great to be able to go. And oftentimes when you're speaking at a conference, your registration fee is waived too. So you get a little financial incentive there too. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the easiest ones is just webinars. I mean, so many labs put on these webinars for CEU credits for us. They're always looking for speakers in new different topics, especially to weave into what they're, they're currently working on. Um, but a lot of organizations, nonprofits, like they want to get it out there, but they don't always have an expert to be including there. So it's really great when you're able to reach out and just say, hey, if you're looking for a speaker, like I'm, I'm kind of starting to learn this and wanting to try it out. So now into kind of more of the meat of the interview tips. So of being a guest, because I, I also do a lot of guests, I've probably been on about 50 podcasts as a guest. And this is a, a tip that I got from my mentor, Ellen Matloff, um, who when I was interviewing to get into genetic counseling school, so kind of different, but you're still interviewing, have five points in your head that you wanna talk about during the interview. So if I'm going on a parenting podcast, and I say, all right, well, I wanna talk about what a genetic counselor is, you usually have to define that for people. Um, want to talk about carrier screening, how you can do that before pregnancy, because a lot of people don't realize that, right? If anyone's worked in prenatal, most of the time you're ordering carrier screening when they're already pregnant. Um, talk about NIPS, non-invasive prenatal screening, and just kind of how that is, how that works. I often also talk about direct consumer, because usually they ask about that too, in terms of 23andMe and Ancestry, and a lot has changed over the last 10 years with that. 
Um, and then talk about what you should ask family before going into a genetic counseling session. What should you be asking your mom, your grandma, whoever is kind of the historian in the family about who had what cancer, how old were they? Oh, uncle Tom had what, you know? So talking about that. And usually if it's a parenting podcast, those are my points. So if they ask me like, oh, what's something surprising that, uh, you know, you're, you're really shocked people don't know about genetics. I could pick any of those, right? And then it's boom, go. And then I'm like, all right, I've already talked about DTC testing. Now, the next time they ask something generic, I could pick one of the others. So, and if you're able to weave in a story, even better. When people are listening, especially to an interview, being able to provide some kind of story and storytelling is so powerful. You wanna do your research on the host. So whoever's interviewing you, right? So if you're coming on my show, it's helpful to know I'm a genetic counselor. Um, I don't have a PhD, so maybe you don't wanna talk that level to me. <laughs> But also, I don't know nothing about genetics, right? I know some, I would say I know more than the average person, right? Um, so knowing the background of the host, how much they know about genetics. If you're going on NPR, that person might know more science than you thought. Um, they might know nothing, right? And being able to go down to a fourth grade, you know, I wanna say reading level, but you're talking, a fourth grade comprehension level is really, I find the goal. Some people say eighth grade, but Science can be tough for people, right? Everybody's sitting here, a lot of this comes second nature to us at this point in our careers. But especially knowing the audience, are you talking to a general audience like NPR or are you talking to genetic professionals, which is most people that listen to my podcast, right? You come on my show, you don't need to define what DNA is. You go on NPR, you might want to, depending on how that conversation in the interview is going. Something I clearly struggle with and I'm always trying to get better at is speaking slowly. I grew up in the New York area, so I like talking fast, and I'm really energized and engaged by all this. So then I get excited, I talk fast. New York based, I talk fast. Um, whenever a uh, family listens into different things, they say, it was so great, but in the middle there, you just talked way too fast. So we're all trying to get better, right? We're all learning. But try to speak slowly, unlike me. So tips for being an interviewer. I've done a lot more of this than being a guest. So some of this, is the same, right? You wanna do your research, but you really wanna do your research on the guest. If they wrote a book, if they wrote many books, you might need to choose the most recent one, but read the book, okay? I can't tell you how many times people are like, wow, you actually read the book? I'm like, yes, I've read your book, I'm interviewing you. That's very rude if other people aren't. Um, listen to other interviews they've done. Some people don't do that, some people do. You don't wanna copy questions that other people have asked them, but sometimes it's nice to hear what they've talked about so you can ask them other questions. Like, wow, people keep asking these five questions, but I wanna get a little bit deeper. I wanna ask this other area. Um, talking about making a plan. So you wanna make sure you send interview questions ahead of time, or at least some kind of thing, like these are bullets of what we'll talk about, like subtopics. When I'm a guest on a show and they're like, yeah, great, we'll have you on. I'm like, awesome, like, what do you wanna focus on? Honestly, it's a casual show, we kinda of see where it goes. That can be great if it's like a comedy show. I'm not a comedian, so I don't do those shows. Having some kind of plan, because what if they're gonna ask me about a certain epigenetic something and, and how this works and that, I don't know. You know, sometimes they'll start asking me stuff and I, that's not my area, I don't know, I, you know. so having that ahead of time, that sometimes I'll say, oh, I see you have a point in here about this. I can speak very generally, but if you start asking me more questions, you know, can't do that. And then it makes, if you say, oh, I don't know, then it makes it awkward in the interview and it makes the interview feel, interviewer feel kind of bad. So as the interviewer, please plan ahead of time, share some kind of doc, some kind of plan. At the beginning, I never jump right into an interview. I always have a little chit chat at the beginning, right? So. And I'm, I'm doing this for a couple different reasons. One is to make sure the audio sounds good. So I'm like, okay, do they have a fan running? Do they have a Roomba going? Is the phone still on? Because I hear it just rang. Um, so different things like that. So from an audio engineering standpoint, I'm taking in the surroundings. You have a window open, you gotta shut that. Um, so different things that I know are gonna have issues coming up. But also I wanna make sure that the guest feels much more comfortable. For most of my shows, it's semi live to tape, but we're not live. So I'm like, hey, you mess up, just say, oh, hold on, I'm gonna redo that question. Count to three silently in your head. If it's awkward staring at each other, you could do fingers up while you're kind of counting in your head. Um, and so that they're kind of aware of this. Um, this is so important because earlier in my career when I didn't do this, some people were more stiff and they're like, it's my first podcast, a lot of people. 
And so being able to just chit chat and be like, hey, this is a little bit about me and you know, this is live tape, whatever it is, just make people feel much more comfortable. And be aware of your timing. So because my show is also on the radio station, I know if I don't get it in under a half hour, that episode won't play on the radio. So for me, I'm always aware of that. Also, for genetics podcasts, I feel like half hour is good. I think if you're going longer than that, at least for me and, and people that listen, I don't know, are they kind of tuning out after that point? Commutes tend to be an average of 30 minutes as well for people listening that way. Um, and then actively listen. This is, I think, the hardest one. When you're doing an interview, you're like, oh my gosh, as soon as there's silence, I need to ask that next question, right? You're like, what is that next question? And then you're just waiting for them to stop talking. Ugh, you don't wanna do that, right? You wanna make sure that you're listening and you can respond to what you're saying, the, the guest is saying, and then kind of transition into that next question. And the next question you were thinking of asking may not be the one you actually do when you start listening to the person. You might be like, oh, my next question, I just asked the first, you know, I'll ask the second, but they may say something that's relevant to question seven on your list. It's really great once you can get to a point to switching gears and saying, now I'm gonna ask that question instead. Um, or you might just have curiosity get the best of you, right? That's awesome when you have that in the moment because if you're curious about something, so are the people listening in the audience. And then what a lot of genetic counselors do is rephrasing. So kind of re-explaining sometimes what your guests did. So if the guest is talking about something, I remember at one point uh, I was doing an interview about telomeres and it was a very complex answer. And I knew generally what telomeres were, right? But can I tell you every little bit about them? Definitely not. So I'm like, oh, interesting. So it's kind of like, you know, the end of your shoelace, kind of that protecting part of if the chromosome is like your whole shoelace, you know, I think it's called the aglet, right? I randomly think I know that. Um, and so that's kind of the protection part so that your shoelace doesn't unravel. And if it is gone, it will unravel. Um, and then the guest is like, yeah, yeah. And sometimes I'll do that and I get it wrong, right? <laughs> But if I get it wrong, honestly, I keep it in the recording because maybe the guests was, or the people listening are thinking the same way. And then I was corrected, so then the listeners are also corrected. So even when you mess up, I think it can be helpful to keep in there. Something else to be mindful of is being inclusive. So when I am interviewing someone, um, as part of when they schedule that time on my Calendly, I have them have the option to include their pronouns. Um, so that way I already have that going into meeting with them. That's great. Um, and I leave it blank for those that don't want to include that. And then I'm just using their name over and over and that's fine. Um, not using jargon. So as I said earlier, like even when I said NIPS, I'm like, I don't know if everyone will know that here. I don't know if everyone's in pregnancy prenatal. So then I said non-invasive prenatal screening. So trying to use simple terms and not using acronyms as much as we do, we use a lot of acronyms in science. So this one is harder, but I think it's really helpful because people are also listening to it. You start saying a bunch of letters, you're losing people. Um, being aware of your biases, right? So just as you're interacting with people, um, you know, obviously that's kind of counterintuitive, right? Like implicit bias, but discovering that about yourself. And with that, taking feedback from people that you've interviewed or been interviewed by of like, hey, is there anything that you felt like I could do better next time? Like I'm really working on being a speaker or being a guest or interviewer or whatever, you know, that role looks like for you um, because you're only gonna get better over time. And part of it is even having, giving feedback for yourself. So I know it's hard, but listen back to yourself because you will, you know, depending on what the editor did, you might be like, I was amazing. And it's because they took out all your filler words. You can, if you've been on my podcast, we don't take out filler words, so you can truly listen to how you sound. Uh, we, we take out, you know, a, a big, hey, let's redo that question, but um, listening to yourself, and you will get used to the sound of your own voice. It's tough at the beginning, I will admit, but you will get through that, okay? <laughs> Gotta do it. Um, if you are doing interviews, looking at kind of timeline, I try to book out one to two months. Doesn't always happen. Episode I recorded a couple days ago is coming out next week. It happens. Um, but just making sure you're keeping in mind how long it's gonna take you to research, how long it's gonna take you to write interview questions. Um, being able to use things like ChatGPT to put a bunch of information in and then say, hey, come up with interview questions. This is the guest bio, this is what I wanna focus on. You could paste a whole PubMed article in there and say, come up with questions for that. That is a draft though. That is not, here's my interview, done. Um, making sure that you read through that. 
and again, sending that to guests. I cannot um, you know, focus on that enough. And having enough time to edit, especially if you have video aspect, that's gonna take longer. Coming up with your promotional material, coming up with like the blog post or something that's associated with whatever you're doing. So all of that. Um, I'm gonna skip this, but use ChatGPT. Seriously, play around with it if you have it. I think it's a fantastic free tool. Um, and just as I start wrapping up, for those that maybe don't wanna be talking, that's not your medium, writing, right? It, we still need writers. Um, I've done a little bit of this with Sanogenetics or Sanogenetics, I'm so sorry, I can never remember how to pronounce that one, um, but did an Explain by Genetic Counselor series and they're obviously UK based, right? I got to use like British uh, terms, it was great. But looking at what are popular subjects that people are searching, maybe breaking news, frequently asked questions. What are people always asking you when you're at parties of when you say you work in genetics? And they go, geriatrics, no, 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 genetics. Once you get through that part, what do they ask you, right? They ask you about the DTC companies. They ask you about, well, is everybody gonna get their genome done, right? So things that come up for you a lot, you may think, oh, well, there's definitely articles and different blog posts written about that, but not always. Um, as I said earlier, aiming for that fourth grade reading level, because then it's truly accessible to most of the US. Um, and honestly, uh, for other places that um, speak and comprehend English. Um, I found it really helpful to, as I write, to read it out loud after, because I find, oh, that is a run-on sentence. I'm losing breath just reading it. So reading it out loud and, and looking at search engine optimization of having the title of your post be, you know, really uh, maybe clickbaity, um, and looking at those keywords. Um, something that I learned of doing this is a lot of times when you're working for another organization or something, you don't actually come up with your own title a lot, which I did not realize until I started doing this. Um, so depending on the situation, if you're writing and getting paid to do this for another company or you know, organization of some kind, they might pick the title for you. And you might be like, that is so misleading, but like, you don't always get to choose it. So that's pretty normal. Uh, but just some examples of topics I've done before, like what is a genetic carrier? Cause so many people get those results from their OB. What is this? Are DNA tests safe? I didn't come up with that, but I didn't realize a lot of people search that. Um, what is a genetic variant of uncertain significance? That's really common, right? That comes up a lot, probably for everyone in this room. Um, and just wanted to give a shout out um, to team members. I couldn't um, do all the podcasting by myself. Um, so we have a bunch of different people that work on the team and it changes over the years. Um, but, you know, being able to have, uh, you know, people do video, I'm Andrew Andrioli, Kajal Patel for social media, and Ashlyn Anokian is a, a fellow genetic counselor that uh, designed our logo um, and does other projects for us. Um, and here I warned you, I was going to ask you to do something. Would so appreciate if you nominate us in the podcast award. So we won three years in a row. I was like, this is great. So last year I was like, you know, we're, we're on a great streak. Like I won't push it as much. And then we lost last year. So we got to reclaim our title, right? We want a genetics podcast to win in science and medicine, right? We're all, we're all going to win with this. Um, and for people that have been on the show, your episode then gets a lot more visibility. Um, so I tried to make it easy. You just got to put your info in. Um, if you check that box that says, please include me for future voting in August or something, that's great because basically they do nominations and then there's voting um, if you get chosen for that basically. They only choose a certain percentage of um, the people that are going in there. But if you scroll all the way down to science and medicine, if you're doing it on your phone, it's usually on the right side of the column. Can you tell I've done this a lot? Uh, and then select DNA today, it's alphabetical, should be easy to find. And then just scroll down, click save nominations, would super appreciate that. Um, the QR code is also there, but if anyone has any questions or anything, I'm also hanging around for a lot of today. So um, just appreciate everybody's uh, attention and stuff. You guys have an awesome audience. All right, we have a microphone here that hopefully is on. And so since we're videoing this, we want people to come to the mic to ask questions. And I'm expecting movement fairly soon. I'm happy to start. I'm going to start um, with uh, one humorous point and then uh, one serious question. The, the humorous point is you showed a slide earlier, and it was you three times, and you said you were having a bad hair day. Yes. I didn't even know which of the ones they were talking well, about. My hair was up, obviously. See, I, I, that's, I think you, other people no, no, no. The, you know, I'm just pointing out. Now, not no. Some it's because you have short hair. Your hair no, is it's, it's you know I know a lot of genetics, but I can't identify bad hair days very uh, accurately. So okay, so it was the far it's right kind one. Kind of a compliment, I suppose. I don't yeah, know if it, it is the, or not. It was, no, the, it was the far 
far right? What, right? It was all the way at the end. My hair was up. Okay, I couldn't figure yeah. that out. I confused. Otherwise, yeah, I followed your entire talk. Um, <laughs> my, my question is, um, remind me, you're, when we've done podcasts, I know we've done them by Zoom, so there's a video component. Does that video also get posted? Yes, I'll move okay. over here okay. so that the recording yeah. gets it. Sure. Um, so yeah, so we started in 2021 recording and releasing video. Um, so we record on something called Riverside, which is kind of, I find a better version of Zoom. The quality is better. It also has a bunch of tools when I'm done recording to be able to edit. Um, so we do release that. So that is on our YouTube channel. Um, it's at DNA Today Podcast um, is on there. So, so, so all, all the episodes are also video. Yes. So you, ha you have both. And I get my mm -hmm. question was going to be, does the, because I bet you, did Zoom, did the video part get more convenient during the pandemic because of Zoom or you were always doing both? Yes, I think it got more important to do video because a lot of other podcasts were starting to include that video component. It is a heavier lift though. It's much easier to just edit audio because you can um, tweak audio so much more. You can manipulate it a lot. I don't mean to use a negative connotation there, but the fact that you can take out filler words and things like that. Um, so other podcasts that I produce that are only audio, I'm doing that for some of the interviews, especially if it's like a lecture of someone, because then it's not conversational based. So you want it to sound very fluid. Um, but yeah, with video, much harder to take out filler words and things like and that. What about the actual uh, recording of it? Because I've done podcasts and radio things in the past when you're just on the phone or you're just mm -hmm. in front of a microphone or you're not even have the person in the same room. And to me, at least as a subject, I've, you know, it's, it's just, it's a very impersonal. Whereas mm -hmm. I've never done that with you. I've only done that when we've had video. Right. And, and I, it's the dynamic that at mm -hmm. least, well, we geek out together. And so yes. that, but have you noticed that as you've used more video, let's pick up, are the interviews feel different? Are you able to Definitely. get that chemistry and the interactions more? Yeah. Cause for okay. years of, virtual interviews. We're doing it on good old Skype and we didn't even have our videos on cause like it wasn't normal back then. Um, a lot more cutting off of each other and like, Oh, I think you're ending. But when you see video, at least it's a little bit more that I could tell when someone's kind of wrapping up. And I think over the years too, I can tell people's voices get quieter when they're ending what they're saying too. Um, which is kind of interesting, but, but it's the, the, it's the, the, the clues back and forth is much better. Line, Even so when we started having video and not releasing it, but just having it on while recording very helpful. Very better. Okay. Yeah. All right. Others, cause I'll keep asking questions, but it looks like several. Oh, here we go. Hi, thank you for your presentation. I'm curious, what do you find most rewarding about being a podcaster and being in this field? I think being able to reach so many people with like one interview and being able to have a platform where I can just bring on an advocate that doesn't have their own platform and ha give them the mic, so to speak, and like being able to say, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to get out there to the world? and being able to have the reach we do of like, we can do that. And I've just been able to talk to so many cool people. And I think what's so cool about podcasting is when you get on, like the first time we recorded together, you know, you're, you're chit chatting and we're like, all right, we're hitting record. You get right into very valuable meaty conversation, right? You're not just like, so what do you do for work? Oh, where do you live? You know, the, the standard almost dating questions, right? When you meet someone, you get right into like real topics. Um, so I think those are kind of the aspects that I, I love about it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So when you started the, your podcast, you were not in the top 1% of no. all podcasts, but you are now. Can you talk about the importance of getting in front of the right people first until you get in front of the most people like you do now? First you had to graduate high school. And then <laughs> you yeah. First I turned 18. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I think with that, like for us, longevity has been a big part of just consistently releasing episodes. Um, we weren't as consistent in the beginning, but then once I kind of got my groove, we were releasing two a month. And then a few years ago, I was like, all right, we're doing it. We're doing a weekly show, um, which is a lot. I don't recommend beginner people to do that. I didn't start doing that until probably eight years, nine years in. Um, but being able to, going back to networking, like having people with more, of a network than me that then share the episode in that ripple effect of if they came on the show, they wanna share that, not just friends and family, but other people in our field. Um, and a big part too has been sharing it with the genetic program. So a lot of them will assign an episode for homework and to listen to it and then come into class and, and chat about it. Um, so I think just being able to 
stick with it has been a big part, but then also get guests that I know are going to be sharing it because then it's growing authentically. You can pay for all these things and fake downloads and you know, all that, but what's the point? You know, I want actually people in our field and for people outside of our field that are trying to learn about it, like patient advocates to be able to learn from it. Yeah. And the other part too is being able to collaborate with other podcasts. So I'm on their show, they're on mine. We can release it on both feeds, like being able to share audiences is very collaborative. It's not, I don't find it to be competitive in that way. Other fields are. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. So I was just curious, so you talked a lot about experts and reaching out on LinkedIn, and obviously then they have something behind their name telling them what they do, but like individuals like Victoria Gray or other patients that you've had on your podcast, how do you go about A, reaching out to those individuals, and then B, the conversation looks a lot different when they're an expert because they have a personal experience with the disease as compared to just studying it. So how do you go about those conversations? Yeah, I mean, finding them um, is always interesting. I'm always trying to find someone that might know them because that's probably going to be a better route. Um, shockingly, Victoria Gray actually did find her on LinkedIn because she posted that she was one of the first um, and was able to just reach out. And she didn't see my comment because there was hundreds of comments, but a lot of sleuthing, a lot of finding email addresses, um, getting celebrities outside of genetics like Lauren Potter, um, getting her was going on IMBD. You can pay for a pro account for a month, which was like 30 bucks or something. And you have access to everybody's, um, even like Jennifer Lawrence, not that she would ever come on my show, but I would restart the Hunger Games show if she did. And uh, <laughs> you want to be on that show? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you'll be my backup, a, a co-host. Co yeah. Um, and if Taylor comes on, oh, then obviously, so yeah, definitely. Taylor Swift for those that are on a first name basis with her. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so being able to do that actually is great. Like I was able to reach out to a lot of people. A lot of people didn't come on, um, but a lot of networking. I recently reached out to Bill Nye. If you're watching this, I really would fangirl if you came on the show, but he was too busy to come on uh, this month. Um, I shoot my shot a lot. I get, I get rejected a lot, but that's the only way it's going to happen. So, um, and sorry, approaching the, the conversation too. I think understanding what their understanding is of how much that they want to talk about and having them talk about what they want to talk about. So I said to Victoria, what do you not get to talk about in interviews? And they said, and she said, and we talked about it on the show, so it's this public information that she wanted to talk about medical racism. And a lot of places said, no, you can't talk about that on my show. And I said, well, that's our topic. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, so for the first, it was an hour interview, so special episode kind of thing. And for the first half hour, that's what we talked about. Her whole experience leading up to that being one of the reasons she decided to do, do the CRISPR. Yeah. Hi, Julie. Hi. Thanks so much for a great talk. I um, saw you at the end. I would have shouted you out when your face was on the slides there. It's totally fine. Um, I wonder if your kind of unique position and the conversations that you've had have made you develop a perspective on science education in this country, and if you could yeah. share that with us. Yeah, I think a lot of it's been interesting that some middle schools, high schools have said, hey, I'm sharing your episode with the class, and they had a couple questions for you or whatever it is, and it makes me realize that it's, I don't know, genetics is a part of it. Like, I grew up in Connecticut, public school. So seventh grade and 10th grade, we covered genetics. And then I elected to do more of that in 12th grade. But um, yeah, it's not as involved as much. And I'm sure other people in the audience with kids would know a lot more of what they're learning now. But um, it is interesting that a lot of teachers are reaching out to these other sources to be able to have that be part of it. Because if kids even still use textbooks, I mean, I never used a genetics textbook. I apologize if maybe I did and I'm forgetting. But we were looking at recent papers that came out this week and that, and so I think the structure of learning is so different when you're looking at something that's changing so much. You can use that for history and math, but you can't with genetics. Other areas of science, I think you can, but I think we need to rely on a lot of these digital tools more. Carrie? Um, so having been a guest on your podcast and talking with you this morning, you have a particular gift for speaking very concisely, and I think this also fits in with your advice to try to make things at a fourth grade comprehension level. So, I mean, literally, like, as you are having thoughts formulating in your head and are trying to speak them out loud, keeping in mind that you try to keep to a 30-minute format, how do you do that, and how are you able to speak so concisely? Yeah, I think part of it is now I have an internal clock for 30 minutes. It's like, it's like <laughs> I feel like it should wrap up, and I'm like, yep, okay. Um, 
I've been more lenient with it, especially with certain interviews. But I think with that is really trying to get to the point of what you're saying. And I think one way that genetic counselors get better at that is using interpreters, right? We were talking about that this morning. Of You want to be as concise as possible. You don't want to be like, do you have siblings? Like when you're doing family history. Oh, okay. How many sisters? How many brothers? How many, you know, you want to be able to kind of put it together in that sense. But also one of the ways I try to be concise is because I don't want to be the one talking. I want the guest to have time. So being able to kind of make a point of pulling out what someone said, which maybe I don't remember, maybe I did with, with you. And was it Andrea? Am I saying her name right? Yeah. Um, she was the um, patient advocate on the, that episode. And being able to pull out a really good point and kind of segue just into the next question. So I almost think like, all right, I want one point and hopefully have that lead into the next question and that's it. Sometimes I'll get on my soapbox and then we'll start talking. I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to wrap this up. Like I'm talking way too much, but certain things I'm like, oh, that's one of them. Like, you know, we need more diversity, like the Pangenome Project, right? Like I'll kind of go on a rant about that, but um, being able to have one point in mind and then your question, I feel like is what I attempt to do, yeah. So I'm going to jump in and ask another question because we have here, we have various training programs here at NHGRI and among yeah. them uh, we have a, now a fellowship program in education. There's our current education fellow and we have one in, in communication. There's our communication. Do you ever give opportunities to, you know, to mentor trainees who are within sort of the, your general space, education, outreach, communication, et cetera, genetics, obviously? Yeah, yeah. So through DNA Today, we have rotations through... Um, Sarah Lawrence and some other genetic counseling programs that I've started with because that I'm more familiar with what they need and what they're currently learning. So that's easier coming from being a student there. Um, but we're very much, I'm always open to expanding other things mentorship. and mentorship, but also like certain internships when someone comes to me and they're like, I want to be a genetic counselor and apply to schools that maybe they'll do a year internship with us and helping out with projects so that they can be exposed to a lot more and have something unique on their resume to then apply. Um, so uh, Corinne Merlino is, is one of our, um, I think she was with us four years and when she was applying to schools, it came up a lot. They're like, oh, DNA Today, I've heard of that. Like, what was your role with that? And it was something different. I think especially yep. applying to a lot of these programs, you wanna stand out and look different, especially when you wanna be in those communication roles. So that's certainly something that we're doing a lot more of in recent years. That's great. Um, and if there's any last questions, jump to the mic. If not, my last question is in the, it seems that there's constantly things, other opportunities that come up in the digital space, mm -hmm. TikTok, you know, various, and there's going to be more, there'll always be. How do you decide when you want to stick your toe in the water and how much you want to stick to the current thing? Yeah. I think some of it is how much extra work will it be? Like logistic wise, can I fit that into me and my team's projects? But also, do I see this one sticking around? Um, I regret a little bit. Not ha We have a TikTok account, but we're not active on it. Because all these different laws and stuff, I'm like, well, are we going to put effort into it? And it's just going to go away? I don't know. But now I'm like, well, I mean, we could have been on there for four years. It really exploded in 2020. Um, so certain things, like you see it, and you're trying to figure out the writing on the wall. But I think what's unique about podcasting is, unlike all these other platforms, you own your RSS feed. So your RSS feed is basically like your URL that you submit to the podcast players. So when you hit play on Spotify, Apple, all the other ones, it's directing you to download from my feed. So if Spotify goes away, if Apple goes away, I still have my feed. I just submit it to the next player. Whereas on these traditional social media platforms like X, all the meta of Instagram, Facebook, all of these TikTok, if they disappear, you lose all your followers. So that's what's really different about podcasting and also email marketing. Because email marketing, you have your list. We have like 7,000 um, people on our email list. Um, so I think it's kind of looking at that too. Am I gonna put a lot of effort into something that's just gonna disappear? And then, all right, if it's sticking around, like get on it as soon as it launches and then see if you wanna post on it. You gotta get the, the username, right? We're the same username everywhere. I can't tell you how long it took to figure that out and get there. But yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. No, thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Kira for a wonderful presentation. <laughs>